a democratic explosion, unprecedented in British history. That's all. Who knew the long, hot summer of 2015 would provide such epochal headlines as this on Jeremy Corbyn, written by the most significant chronicler of our age, Seamus Milne of The Guardian, who joins us now. Seamus, uh, a very powerful opener to your piece in The Guardian this week. It's not an exaggeration. Uh, how come so few people saw it coming? Well, I mean, that is the case. We, I mean, literally nobody saw it coming, inclu coming, including Jeremy Corbyn. But now it's happened. I think we can see what it came out of. But, uh, yeah, I don't think it is an exaggeration because, you know, last week we had, you know, nearly 170,000 people join the Labour Party in one day alone. Uh, and that is now, that's more than... Uh, for example, all the people who voted for David Cameron as le leader of the Tory party in 2005 when he became leader. It's almost the totality of the membership of the Labour Party uh, at the time of the general election three months ago. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Labour Party's tripled in size in, in two months and it's overwhelmingly down to the Jeremy Corbyn campaign. It's something I really think that could not have been foreseen, but it tells us something about the time we're living in you know, both its volatility, but also the fact that there is a deep revulsion against the existing political system and a thirst for something different. And that was looking in Britain to express itself in some way or another. In Scotland, we know how it was expressed through the referendum, the independence referendum and the SNP surge in the general election. I think in the rest of the country, it's being expressed right now through this extraordinary um, leadership election, which at the beginning, you know, when it started in the aftermath of the election, looked like it would be the dullest ever and a kind of reversion to old-style new Labour politics. And it's very much not like that now. Now, as someone who has been um, smeared and slandered, libeled, defamed all of my life, uh, even I'm shocked at the mud they're throwing at Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, but I'm even more surprised that it doesn't seem to be working. Where, where is all this coming from and why isn't it working? Well, that's it. I mean, the, you, you might expect the political class who've been hand-wringing for years about the declining interest in party politics and participation of young people in particular in politics, they, you'd think they'd be delighted that hundreds of thousands are pouring into one of the two main political parties um, to take part in a democratic election, but not a bit of it, of course. Uh, they're absolutely uh, in paroxysms of anxiety because... For once, a, one of the main two political parties is being opened up to a genuine popular surge. And so they're trying everything. We've had one uh, new Labour grandee after another wheeled out to denounce this process, to denounce Corbyn, to say that this is uh, the road to electoral oblivion. And then when that didn't work, they've tried, as you say, more and more ugly smears against uh, Corbyn uh, for his anti-war stance and because he called for dialogue with Hamas and Hezbollah, um, you know, when Tony and Russia. Blair... It's apparently Russia. a great scandal to want better relations <laughs> with Russia. And when, when Tony Blair, um, who has said that, you know, this is, this is Labour dropping off a cliff, has met the leader of Hamas four times in the last three months, so it's a kind of pretty bizarre Alice in Wonderland kind of attack, but it's now got nastier still. They're trying to smear Corbyn um, by association with anti-Semitism. I mean, it's a really ugly campaign, very, I think. Very, very ugly. Now, he's 66 years old. You and I have both known him for uh, the best part of 40 years. Uh, the very last thing in the world you could credibly accuse Jeremy Corbyn of is racism, and, of course, anti-Semitism is racism. I think, you know, that the, the way he is uh, is one of the reasons um, why this stuff isn't sticking. He is so obviously a decent and honest person. He's unspun. You know, he's not a triangulator of any kind. He's been campaigning against racism in all its forms all his life. He's been an indefatigable anti-war campaigner, and people are sick of these endless wars that Britain is involved in uh, and continues to be. He stands for... Uh, an opposition to an austerity regime which has already failed and is, you know, brutally being reimposed, something that's happening all over Europe. And we're seeing this kind of populist upsurge in different forms, both on the left and the right, um, throughout the continent, because, mm. you know, the, 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 syst the, the, the austerity regime that they're imposing isn't working, uh, but it's causing huge suffering across the continent in different 
ways and different times. And so this is a kind of uh, revulsion against that, and it's an expression of a desire for a different kind of politics. And it's happening in different ways, different places, but this is how it's happening in Britain right now. Well, speaking of um, the continent, how is this being watched from, out, from the outside? Or is it so far still a con domestic issue? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's happened so suddenly. I mean, that it's taken us here in Britain by surprise, but I think also internationally. But people do see these things. I mean, they are watched abroad, just like we see what's happening in Greece or in Ireland or in Spain, and, and people are feeding off each other around it. I mean, the, I think the worry now is must be that uh, if Corbyn is elected, which looks increasingly likely against all the odds um, in, next month, you know, that the opposition to him internally in the Labour Party in Parliament by other, other Labour MPs will be intense. Um, they will try and bring him down as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, they will refuse to cooperate with him and try and undermine him in different ways. And it'll be very difficult for anyone, I think, in that circumstance to try and build the leadership of all the talents that he's been proposing. Um, and, uh, of course, he'll be attacked even more savagely both by the Conservative Party, which is, you know, taking down, to use an evidence against him, all the attacks that have been made on him by his other Labour party. leaders' own party, yeah. and the media too. And we've seen the media link arms with the political establishment against this upsurge, this insurgency, um, against and within the political system. After I read your piece in The Guardian this week, uh, I got to thinking, uh, is there any comparator, is there any episode, any movement and I think I know the history of the Labour movement inside out uh, from its uh, inception. I can find none, which makes me wonder, therefore, if this is for the first time uh, a Europeanization, if you like, of uh, British politics, because such things have happened on the continent, mainland continent of Europe, but haven't before in Britain. What do you think about that? I think that's an interesting point. I mean, you know, of course, dramatic things have happened in British political history. I and mean, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the last 150 years, really. I mean, many dramatic things in different ways, and some more dramatic than this, of course. But in this particular form of the mass participation of individual uh, people, and they're not activists, they're not infiltrators, that's just fantasy. No, 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 the idea uh, that there, you could <laughs> fit all the Trotskyists in Britain yeah. into a single gymnasium. The yeah. idea that they are responsible for a tripling of the Labour Party's More size amazing. is absolute nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it is something different. And I think it is very evocative of what's happening internationally. And it's not just in Europe. I mean, you see what's happening at the moment in the United States in the Democratic campaign, the campaign for the US presidential Democratic nomination, and the campaign by Bernie Sanders. Another, He's even older than Jeremy. Another outsider, the, you know, the sole socialist senator in, in the United States, yeah. um, who is beating Hillary Clinton in the primary polls in, in New Hampshire. So, and he's running on a similar kind of platform. So we see, you know, in Spain, in the United States, in Greece, uh, in other countries, in Ireland, in Scotland, we see this same phenomenon repeating itself in different forms in different places. I think it's an internationalization in response to a neoliberal economic system and politics that has been imposed for the last 30 years and which simply can't solve the problems of our time and is, has offered people a political system which is so narrow in its political choices and so technocratic and triangulated, people are sick of it and they want a real choice in politics and suddenly it's emerged here in the most unexpected way it, w with the most unexpected leader. And that's, I mean, I think that's something magnificent about that. But none of us can predict that or predicted it. And it just, it, real life has produced it. Well, uh, this being Russia today, I can, I think, safely quote Lenin who said that there were decades when nothing happens but weeks when decades happen. I think the next few weeks are going to be epochal, as your article uh, pointed out. Um, is Jeremy ready for this? Is his cadre ready to take power? Well, I, Jeremy Corbyn himself, when this started, had no idea where it was going to lead. But I think he's grown into it um, as the campaign has gone on. I mean, anyone, I think, would be strengthened by these kind of huge rallies and enthusiasm of this, what is actually a social movement now, running across the country wherever he goes. I mean, I think he's, he's definitely um, developed a lot in the last six weeks. Um, but of course, in terms of organization and preparation, he's starting from scratch. And it really is a penny farthing 
operation right now. And so that's one of the factors that makes him vulnerable and makes the, the campaign vulnerable um, in the coming weeks. And, mm. uh, of course, the I other think, side yeah. will, um, yeah. will try to exploit people, are, people, people want to start from scratch in Labour terms. They don't want a continuation of the parade of speaking clocks. They don't want the continuation That's of true. the era of focus groups. They don't want someone who knows how to triangulate to the infinite uh, degree. They want somebody who stands up and speaks for them, speaks for what the Labour Party is supposed to be for. And people will and forgive. Got that. Yes, people will forgive any shortcomings of parliamentary tactics in those circumstances. <laughs> I think the supporters definitely will. His supporters will, and people in the country certainly will. But I think you know what what he's facing and what the campaign is facing in September, after September the twelfth, if he's elected, will be uh, quite ferocious. Um, so uh, battle will have to be joined in in a serious way. The last time you and I shared a platform with him was just a few weeks ago at the Latin America conference at the TUC. And he asked me if I thought he was doing the right thing by putting himself forward for the leadership. I asked him, how many nominations do you have at this point? He said 12. He needed 35. It didn't seem then that he would even be on the ballot paper. Those morons, as they're now calling themselves, who lent their vote to him to put him on the ballot paper, they deserve a pat on the back or a round of applause too, don't they? Well, I mean, and to be fair to them, they're not all resiling from it. I mean, you know, it was at, at that time an attempt to have a real uh, democratic yeah. debate within the party. They've done us of a course, service. They didn't realise where it was going to go, and nor did we. But I think, you know, not only have we had the debate, we've had a real democratic alternative uh, within a party where democracy had more or less been entirely closed down and the leader, once he or she was elected, would decide everything. I mean, obviously, that's not going to happen and, uh, anymore. And, uh, and Corbyn himself has said, you know, the policy proposals that he's making are just proposals or suggestions. He wants the Labour Party democracy to decide on those things. So that's something we haven't seen for a very long time. So it's going to be an interesting ride. I'm pinching myself to see if all this is real. Seamus Milne of The Guardian, thank you very much. Now, it's